well, I started, I loved art as a child, and I went to a one-room schoolhouse um, in grades one and two, and grades one through eight all in the same room. And so when the other grades were having class, as a child, you had to make yourself busy while and, and be quiet. And I was um, allowed to go sit in the library, which was a table off to the side window, and use the watercolors. And so I've always loved art as a child. I've loved Scandinavian art as I grew older because I lived in central Minnesota and there was just, you know, that, that type of imagery is everywhere. When you grow up in the upper Midwest, you're just surrounded by Nordic imagery, whether you realize that's what it is or not. When I was on bed rest in about 1993 is when it started, I, um, just to keep myself busy, occupied my time painting out of a book from the Amana colonies that my mom had picked up when she was on vacation, Austrian art. And she said, well, since you're getting so good at this while you're practicing, you should learn to do rose mauling because we're so Swedish. So I called the Swedish Institute and lo and behold, that's a Norwegian art form, not a Swedish art form. And I didn't know that, and there are a lot of people that don't know that. And so um, I found Decorah, Iowa, took a rose mauling class there, um, loved it, fell in love with this world that I didn't know anything about. I discovered all of these paintings that my teacher had been doing, and it was something completely different than rose mauling. And it, it looked Scandinavian, but I wasn't sure what it was. Turns out it's this Swedish art form that was, um, it, it, it is, what they had done 200 years ago was they mimicked medieval tapestries and painted these images on their walls and it looks a little Nordic but it looks a little different and it's narrative storytelling and I was fascinated plus it was Swedish and so that spoke to my heritage and so I asked my teacher if she would be interested in teaching me and I was one of few people that really went on and took the took the Swedishness and kept moving forward with that a lot of my co-painters um, continued to rosemal and rosemal to this day as do I but um, I really have focused largely on the Swedish. It's just been something that's been part of my life. I haven't been able to let it go. What I am focusing on is I paint mostly now in the Swedish styles, and I do sometimes very large wall tapestries painted, um, some, but now I, I do a lot of smaller pieces just because it's easier. Typically done on linen or cloth. Later on in the 1800s, they were done on paper, and I will sometimes paint on paper. They were done with um, egg tempera or a glue paint distemper, which means powdered pigment and mixing it up with egg yolk as a binder and that's what your paints are. The way I try to describe that to somebody is if you've ever had a sunny side up egg and you've left the fork on the plate and you didn't rinse it off right away and you come back later after work, it's pretty hard. And yeah, and so it binds and it sticks and it makes those powdered pigments stick. There's a lot of text and subscript in these paintings that describe what's going on. Um, and so I include a lot of that. And sometimes it's comical, and sometimes it's just the human nature of our shared experiences here in the upper Midwest. There is something in Nordic lifestyle um, called free luftsliv, which is open air living or, or, or free air living. And it's the relationship that we have with the outdoors. Um, having the outdoors be part of our daily life, having a crisp walk in the morning, or um, enjoying just the, the things that that adds to our spiritual health and our physical health. And there's another word, huga, which is the, um, the, the cozy inward feeling that you have in the winter of being indoors, a lit candle and a warm cup of coffee and, and good company. And the state park, that experience was those two words in a nutshell, open air living and huga. And so I had beautiful days where I could be through the park. And then when I was back in the cabin, I had the warm, can the warm cup of coffee and the candle and the painting and I had my huga. And so that open air living brought that inspiration and helped me create. I spent the weekend in the visitor center with all of my work and I was demonstrating and I got to interact with a lot of people that were coming through there. Um, I held a small workshop and that was fun because we made our own paints using egg yolk and powdered pigment. To have time away from your life to just focus on your creating. There's opportunity to interact with um, people at the park, but you're not doing that every day. And I think what is probably the most meaningful is that that to me says that art is valued. 
that the, the creative time of an artist is valued. And it's valued in a way that somebody's gonna put money forward and help, help financially support that. Because, you know, artists almost always have to have a day job. And so you're trying to support your art, and you're trying to be creative and trying to do all of these things. And for someone to come and say, we value this enough to help fund this opportunity for you to just take a break and do something and cr create something for the park and create something for your own self is, is revitalizing. So the piece I made is a Buna's molding and um, the script across the top starts out with, oh, the tonic of wilderness. And I don't remember where I saw that phrase. It was, I saw that phrase somewhere in some literature at some point and I thought, oh, the tonic. So I included that in, as, as the verbiage at the top of the painting. And then the imagery of the painting are things that I actually saw at the park. And I've also included some things that would be present in the park I just didn't happen to see. And it's on raw linen. And I made the background paint myself out of, um, I think that recipe I used flour and eggs and chalk. And that's the background paint. And the paint is made of egg yolk and powdered pigments but then I hung it with a piece of twine on a, on a stick, on a birch stick. And so I thought that was all, it, it, it is of the park and it's for the park. I get to help other people tell their stories using an old technique, using old imagery, using an old traditional folk art that's been around for a long time. We're just her taking it in a new direction.